So on this beautiful Purple Friday, we got a lot to talk about, especially some real exciting rumors and news when it comes to all Baltimore Ravens. They're being linked to a wide receiver that they've been linked to for years. Let's see if anything comes to fruition this season. Also, TJ Hushmanzada has some like wild outlandish comments about Lamar Jackson. We got some injury status updates, especially when it comes to their offensive line. We got your questions coming up. We got so much to talk about in this video. Let's get straight into it. So this article is from SportsIllustrated.com. It says Ravens linked to trade for superstar wide receiver. Well, he used to be a superstar. He ain't a superstar no more, but he's somebody that could still help get the job done, and that is none other than Mr. DeAndre Hopkins. Let's read what the report says. It says, um, the Baltimore Ravens are in dire need of some help in their receiving core, and the Tennessee Titans may have the answer for them. With the Titans getting off to an 0-3 start, I mean, we ain't far behind, and we want it too. Hopefully, this, after this weekend, we get to 2-2. Two two. But anyway, it says, with the Titans getting off to an 0-3 start, trade rumors are beginning to swirl around star wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. And Anthony Palacios of Last Word on Sports has mentioned the Ravens as a potential destination for the veteran. Now, I know there will be some people that say, oh, we're a running team. What we need receivers for? Oh, we already got Zay Flowers and Rashad Bateman and Nelson Aguilar. It could always help. It could not hurt to upgrade your wide receivers. Now, is DeAndre Hopkins a DeAndre Hopkins of old? No. Is DeAndre Hopkins somebody that can come in here and upgrade the Baltimore Ravens wide receiver unit and give the Baltimore Ravens a sure-handed wide receiver that ain't afraid to get nasty either? Yes, certainly, certainly. And if the Baltimore Ravens, if they end up making the playoffs, which I expect them to, and if they decide they're going to abandon the run game, which I, I, I don't want to say I expect them to because we got Derrick Henry now, but still you never know with these Baltimore Ravens. But if they're going to go pass happy and pass heavy, be prepared for it. Just be prepared for everything. Be prepared to run the ball because by that time, Derrick Henry will be around. We'll have Justice Hill, and we should have Keaton Mitchell back as well, but also be prepared to pass the ball. So the better your options, the more merrier your team will be. Anyway, continuing with the article, it says, the Ravens and Chiefs may be better fits for DeAndre Hopkins due to their recent history of success in the postseason, and they could look to bolster their offense. ESPN's Dan Graziano initially linked the Pittsburgh Steelers to DeAndre Hopkins, but there is no question that Baltimore would make sense too. Outside of Zay Flowers, the cupboard is pretty bare for the Ravens at wide receiver. As a matter of fact, Flowers is the only wide out on the roster with double figure catches through three games. And that's not really a surprise because Zay Flowers is featured a lot in Baltimore Ravens offense. There's, then there's also Rashad Bateman. There's Nelson Aguilar. There's Tylen Wallace. There's Tez Walker. We ain't seen the field yet. So it ain't no such shocker that Zay Flowers is the only receiver with double-digit catches so far. Um, and especially the way that the Baltimore Ravens offense runs. Yeah. Anyway, continuing, it says, the receiver position has been a problem area for the Baltimore Ravens for quite some time. And this past offseason, the Ravens did not do much of anything to address the issue outside of selecting Devontae's Walker in the fourth round of the draft. Walker does not even have a catch yet. So I know they were looking at the stat sheets. Whoever wrote this article, they were looking at the stat sheets. They looked at the Ravens' depth chart at wide receiver. They said, man, this, this dude who they drafted, he ain't even got a catch yet. But he ain't even seen a field yet. He ain't even seen a field. And while we didn't expect him to come in this season to have this major impact and go crazy, we wouldn't have been mad if he did. But he hasn't even been active for a game yet. Anyway, continuing. He says, Hopkins may not be the same dominant pass catcher from his Houston Texans days, but he will certainly make Baltimore's aerial attack better. The 32-year-old has gotten off to a slow start in 2024, having logged just eight catches for 90 yards and a touchdown. I mean, that, that, that's, as a Raven receiver, that would be great. That would be amazing. But anyway, uh, he said, but last season he hauled in 75 receptions for 1,057 yards and seven touchdowns. I didn't realize he had all that last year. I didn't realize that. I, wow. That's, that's pretty good. For, whoa. I, I didn't realize he had all that, man. Now, um, when we think about the possibility and potential of a DeAndre Hopkins with the Baltimore Ravens, if he was to come here, what could you realistically expect? Would he pop off for 75 catches for over 1,000 yards? I don't think so. But I don't think that would be a realistic expectation. And I don't even think the Baltimore Ravens would need him to do that. Now, if they did get that out of him, oh, great, amazing. But I don't even think that would be necessary for him. If he came over, got like 
seven, eight hundred yards. And it would all depend on when he came over too. Because the trade deadline, I think they extended it to like week eight, something like that. Week eight or week. I forgot when exactly when it is, but um it would depend on when they landed him if they end up landing him. We'll see. Um but as long as he was just ready, man. Ready when your number's called. He would give the Baltimore Ray. He would allow things to be opened up that much more for Zay Flowers. Allow things to be opened up that much more for Rashad Bay. Allow things to be opened up for Isaiah Likely. Mark Andrews, like, having him on the field, he would open a lot of stuff up. Is he burning past defensive backs? No. But he would give Lamar Jackson somebody who could make contested catches. Somebody with short hands who Lamar Jackson could trust. Like, could really trust. Uh, he could be a red zone threat. He could be a great receiver to get you first down. Like, he can do so much for your team and so much for other people on your team. It will give them yet another weapon. And that was, that's never going to be anything that I'm ever mad about, the Baltimore Ravens adding weapons for Lamar Jackson. And this is somebody who Lamar Jackson requested last year, if y'all remember. Because remember, he requested both Odell Beckham Jr. and a DeAndre Hopkins. So they got Odell Beckham Jr. last year, and he did all right. He got 535 yards, I think. He, he, he was solid. Wasn't great. Definitely wasn't the Odell Beckham Jr. of old, and DeAndre Hopkins wouldn't be the, the DeAndre Hopkins of old, but he could still be somebody that could come in and contribute positively to the Baltimore Ravens. Anyway, continuing, it says, um, Hopkins began his career with the Texans in 2013 and remained with the club to 2019. So anyway, that's just going over uh, his stats. But yeah, if the Baltimore Ravens were to get a DeAndre Hopkins, I wouldn't be mad at that. And, and with the Titans, them being 0-3 right now, if that continues, if they just continue this slump, and especially if the Baltimore Ravens continue ascending, then that could be a trade that could make sense. Because you know what, teams, when they do bad and they continue doing bad, then they're like, you know what, everybody wants to go. We don't care who it is. Take them off our hands, especially if it's an older player who's not in the team's future like that, like a DeAndre Hopkins. Then they'll be like, oh, okay, whatever. What, what, what you gonna give? Him, what you gonna give him? Uh, give us for him? It, it could be like a fifth or sixth round. It, it would really be nothing that the Baltimore Ravens could acquire DeAndre Hopkins for. So we'll see. It's one of those things where. We just got to see how everything plays out. But how would y'all feel if the Baltimore Ravens got DeAndre Hopkins at this stage of his career, at this stage where the Baltimore Ravens are at? Now, I haven't covered these Baltimore Ravens for quite some time, especially under the Lamar Jackson era. You have heard a lot of people say a lot of wild things when it comes to Lamar Jackson. Some uh, crazy hot takes, some are borderline disrespectful. Some are past the borderline of disrespect. And what T.J. Huchmanzada said in regards to Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow, I was like, what? Really? I wish I could play the clip, but I, I can't mess with uh, ESPN or whatever network it was on. But T.J. Huchmanzada, he was on with Joy Taylor and some other people, and he said that every single team in the league except the Chiefs and the Bills they would trade for Joe Burrow. Every last one of them except those two teams would trade for Joe Burrow over. Oh, okay. 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 We, the, the, the lights went out. Okay. Now, all right. Now we good. Now, but anyway, he said, see, the electricity here ain't even agree with what TJ Hushmanzada had to say. But he said they, any team besides those two would trade for Joe Burrow. And when I, and then Joy, Joy Taylor, she said, uh, the Ravens? And he said, yes, the Ravens. They would trade Lamar Jackson for Joe Burrow. And Joy Taylor, she knew. She was like, no, that, no they, they would not do that. But he was like, yes, they would. And when I, I said, what? What? Like, look, Joe Burrow's cool. Joe Burrow, he, he could play. But Baltimore Ravens ain't doing that, man. Like, Sarah, we're going to talk about some stuff that Sarah Ellison highlighted. But even before we get to that. Like, you think about Lamar Jackson and you think about Joe Burrow. They both could play, obviously. But Lamar Jackson, um, you think about the two MVPs. And with those two MVPs, you look at the guys that he had at the wide receiver. But you look at his weapons. Look, look at those. And then you look, look at Joe Burrow. Look at who he's had, the weapons that he has had at running back, at wide receiver especially, at tight end. And the, offense, the way the offense is designed to end, he hasn't done 
what Lamar Jackson has done on an individual level. He has gotten farther than Lamar Jackson has. He got one game farther because he went to the Super Bowl. Lamar Jackson and made it to the AFC Championship. So he's gotten one game further. But as far as individual success, like, Lamar has not had the, the privilege of having the weapons that Joe Burrow has had. And that's something that a lot of Ravens fans we talk about, we've been talking about for years. Like, you see what Lamar Jackson has done with the weapons that he's had. Imagine if he has studs like that. Like a Jamar Ch- a T. Hick- a healthy T. Higgins, by the way. But a T. Hick- oh, oh, my goodness. He could go crazier than he already goes a lot of times. But anyway, shout out to Sarah Ellison because she brought up even more points on why that argument that the Ravens would trade for Joe Burrow over Lamar Jackson why is just insane. She said the following. Both are excellent quarterbacks, but TJ Hushmanzada is wrong and Joy Taylor is correct. Ravens would not trade because she said Lamar Jackson is better than Joe Burrow. So she said, number one, he's eight and one versus the Bengals. Yeah, Lamar Jackson, when it comes to the Bengals. I remember that one that one game where we lost to the Bengals. Like it was close for a while. <laughs> Joe Burrow and the Bengals, they just start taking off. But anyway, um, he's eight and one versus the Bengals. Four and one head to head versus Joe Burrow. Also, two-time MVP, like we talked about. And she said, this is a good one right here. She said, Burrow has missed more starts, 13 of them, due to injury than Lamar Jackson has, nine, despite being in the NFL for two fewer years. I didn't realize that. I I didn't realize that uh, Burrow has missed more time than Lamar Jackson. And that's big. And, And she even mentioned he's been in the league for a shorter period of time. He's been in the league for two fewer seasons, but he still missed more games than Lamar Jackson. So many times that word injury prone, injury prone, injury prone, it gets thrown around on Lamar Jackson. And again, like I tell y'all, I believe that when he missed the end of those two seasons, I think it was all contract stuff. I think it was all just very hard, tough negotiations. That's what I think it was. But with Joe Burrow, uh, I, I again, I didn't realize he missed all that time. But anyway, uh, continuing. She said uh, Burrow advancing one more. Oh, yeah, that's what we talked about, too. She said Burrow advancing one more playoff round than Lamar three seasons ago does not overcome all of that. You know, a, a quote that I saw from I forgot who it was. Somebody said that Joe Burrow gets more credit for losing the Super Bowl than Matt Stafford does for winning it. And I thought about that. I said, man, that might be true. Because you always hear people talk about Joe Burrow. You hear people talk about how he's this and that. And they, he's always up there when they talk about top five quarterbacks, or top six, seven quarterbacks. Joe Burrow's always up there. And I ain't got no problem with nobody listening to anything. But then you think about Matt Stafford. And Matt Stafford, somebody who he be put, he be putting in work too. He be putting in work. I know this season's been a little, but he usually be putting in work. But his name is not listed up there that much. And then you think about the Super Bowl. Too. Like, he, he was on the other side of that Super Bowl, and it does not get talked about enough that he won. We hear more about Joe Burrow and them making it there, but we, we don't hear as much about Matt Stafford and them actually winning it. But anyway, T.J. Hushman's out of, man. Like, come on. Baltimore Ravens rookie first round pick Nate Wiggins uh, he played very sparingly in that first game against the Chiefs and then in week two against the Raiders he did not play at all uh, and John Harbaugh said that he was in a car accident we were like oh man what, what happened with Nate Wiggins but Harbaugh said that he was straight he was all right uh, but Nate Wiggins provided a little bit of details uh, on that car accident um, a few days ago and he said the following he said uh, that he was driving in an 18 wheeler cut him off and he said, the, the 18-wheeler cut me off the road. It made my car flip. And he said, I was obviously scared. Uh, and that, and he had a Lamborghini. Uh, so that, that is very scary stuff. Um, to Number one, be cut off on a road while you're driving. Number two, for it to be an 18-wheeler. So that's a huge, long truck. Uh, and then for your car to flip, like, that, that, that's just that's insanely scary. Um, and Wigan said that the accident happened two minutes away from his apartment. So he's super close to home, super close to home. And it's just it makes you really, really appreciate just everything that much more, especially when you get into a car accident, um, because it could have went so many different ways, but it went a good way for him, which is great. Um, and hopefully even the, the truck driver will cut him off. Hopefully they straight too. Um, but that's some scary stuff. But we glad that Nate Wiggins, he made it out. 
He's obviously doing good. And like he came back. He he missed he missed one game, he missed the Raiders game, but came back against the uh the Cowboys and was an impact player literally from jump. We had a question um from Team Keep It Clean. Somebody asked, When do you think Nate Wiggins is going to be a starter? And my response, he already is. How's that saying go? Patience is a virtue. Uh, a lot of Ravens fans, a lot of fantasy football fans, they all love Mark Andrews because they know, hey, when they play in fantasy football, like Mark Andrews is going to produce like crazy. But this year he hasn't so far. And we've been wondering, like, what's going on with him? He was also in a car accident a couple of weeks before the season started. Harbaugh also said, hey, he was straight. It was minor. Thank goodness, which was great. Um, but Mark Andrews, it's been pretty quiet season for him. Now, we know with Mark Andrews, like, a big game could come out of nowhere. It, it could happen out of nowhere at the drop of a dime. We know how it goes. But what has been going on with Mark Andrews? How does Mark Andrews feel about what's been going on? Or really what hasn't been going on with him as far as productivity? He said the following. He said, I feel good. I feel like I'm running fast. I'm the same old Mark doing the same old things. My time will come. But again, I'm just worried about execution and helping this team win. However I can do that, I will. And A, that is the politically correct answer. Shout out to you, Mark Andrews, for... Making a nice little statement on that, uh, being very team oriented, and, and and that's great. Now you know, especially as a pass catching tight end, Mark Andrews ain't no blocking tight end. He's a pass catching tight end. I think this is Mark Andrews' slowest start in the history of his career. So this is something that he's just not used to, like this. This is unfamiliar waters for Mark Andrews. But the fact that he's still being a good teammate, and he's hey, he doing the dirty work too. Because we saw that last game, like the tight ends were not called upon in the passing game, but in the run, run game, they were asked, block. Charlie Cole, go out, go out there and block. I say likely go out there and block. Mark Andrews, go out there and block. Even though that's not his specialty, but hey, he's willing to do it. So he did say the politically correct like statement in regards to his role in his offense and the fact that he ain't producing so much yet, but he's also shown the action too. Because if he went out there and did a little halfway block, like, uh, get out the way. Like, oh, move out the way so I'm not running back and run. Then that'd be one thing. But the fact that he's out there, like, really putting in the work, that says another. And that's a really good sign uh, for Mark Andrews and just his love for the team. You know he got love for this team. Um, but you also know he got love for catching passes. He got love for making plays. And that's what he wants to do much more than be a blocker. Any wide receiver or tight end will want to do that much more than be a blocker. You think running backs want to sit up there and pass protection all the time? No, they want the ball in their hands. Playmakers want to make plays. So when I, I know when people throw out the word diva, oh, this person's a diva, that person's a diva. I hate when people throw it because they use that word so loosely. And it does not apply to everybody. But you, you can't be mad at somebody for wanting to do their job. And sometimes they got to be vocal about it. But with Mark Andrews, he is taking a high road, which I, I appreciate because that's really good for the team. So today it was said that Andrew Voorhees and Jalen Armour Davis both did not return to practice. What we said at the beginning of this week when the Baltimore Ravens first started practicing and Tyler Linderbaum was out, Makari was out, uh, Voorhees was out. We said we weren't going to trip. We were going to wait because it was just Wednesday. And Thursday rolled around and we said if they if they didn't practice on Friday, then that's what we would be concerned. Voorhees still isn't practicing. Harbaugh did say, oh, he's going to be questionable right up until the game time, game time decision and whatnot. Voorhees ain't playing. He, he, he is not going to play. Um, but now, so the Baltimore Ravens, they have a, a decision to make on the offensive line. What are you going to do? Are you going to start Roger Rosengarden at right tackle and slide Pat McCarry over the left guard? Or are you going to keep Pat McCarry at right tackle and start Ben Cleveland at left guard? Are you going to put Roger Rosengarden at right tackle and put Ben Cleveland at left guard? Like you, you have options. You got Josh Jones. That's another option too. So the Baltimore Ravens have some options on what they can do and who they can plug there. So we'll see what they do, but let's hope that whatever decision they make, that it ends up being very effective. Now we've entered my favorite part of these videos where we get to feature your questions. If you would like to take part in this, you can send me an email at teamkeepitclean at gmail.com or for the Team Keep It Clean patrons, you can send it directly on Patreon. If you would like to join the Team Keep It Clean patrons, 
You can go to patreon.com slash angravenviz, and if you don't want to, it is A-OK. -okay. Just team keep it clean. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn your notifications on so you don't miss a single video, a single update when it comes to our Baltimore Ravens. And also leave a like on it. Click that thumbs up button, baby. Leave a like on the video because it'll be helping out the channel a ton. Let's get to the first question. It came from my guy, Derek. He said, Engraven, hey, what's up, Derek? Do you think that's why the Ravens didn't resign Tyler Honey during the offseason in the spring because they were pursuing Justin Fields? What do you think the Ravens offered? And man, that would have brought stability to our QB room even more so. Uh, so our offseason additions could have been both Derrick Henry and Justin Fields. Why, oh, why? Shaking my head. T Mike Tomlin stands in our way again. He said Jacoby Jones reference, LOL. Oh, and then don't forget Calvin Austin, too, because the Ravens wanted to draft him, but the Steelers jumped and got him. But anyway, um, that I, I, I just think they were going to be moving on from Tyler Huntley, and they wanted to, him to go get an opportunity elsewhere. Because an opportunity that he got got elsewhere, they like I don't think they I just don't think they really wanted to pay him anything, um, and he could have possibly gotten more money elsewhere. So I, I think there was like one of those things where they were like, all right, Tyler Huntley, go 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 try, go go see what you're worth, go see what offers you get and whatnot. And hey, he went to the Browns, he went to the Browns for a little bit, that ain't work out. Then he came right back home to the Ravens. Ravens like, all right, cool. You go chill on the practice squad. And now he's in Miami getting ready to start on Monday Night Football. So hopefully he just kills it and crushes it. And your other question was, what do I think the Ravens offered for a Justin Fields to the Chicago Bears? Maybe that little infamous fifth or sixth round pick. Next question came from my guy, James. He said, hey, Raven, I've been watching you for some years now. Appreciate that, James. Thank you, man. He said, is it because Justin Tucker gained weight for his, this new kickoff rules? He's been missing. Remember, everything plays a factor. Hmm. That's, that's, I forgot about that because I remember they did say Justin Tucker, he, he been putting on some muscle for the new kickoff rules. So I didn't think about that, but I don't know. I don't know because if you put on more weight, then that could give you some more power, but I don't, it, it hasn't been a power issue with Justin Tucker. It's been an accuracy issue. So I, I'm sure it could play a factor maybe, but I just, I really don't know what it is. And speaking of Justin Tucker, next question came from Tammy. She said, everyone forgets Justin Tucker is used to kicking on mostly open fields and not closed in stadiums. Well, while that is true, kicking on a closed stadium, that should be easier because with the open fields, there's no elements or anything like that. So a closed stadium, like that's, that should be easy. That should be money. But the thing is, like, this year, Justin Tucker, he's been missing in open fields. He's been missing in, at away game open field. He missed at Chiefs Stadium. He missed at home for the Baltimore, at the Baltimore Ravens Stadium, which is outside. And then he missed indoor at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. So he's missing everywhere. Blind staffing. Next question came from my guy, Ken Yar. He said, I ain't graven. Sorry, but it may be lengthy because I'm frustrated. Feeling like Lamar on Marlon Humphreys live. <laughs> I like that. He said, first of all, blessings to you and the family. I hope Lil Ng is doing well. Hey, I, I appreciate that. He said, I'm about to ask a bunch of, of rhetorical questions that we all want to know. When is Bateman going to make an impact? Now, he sent this on September 23rd, and the game was on September 22nd. So, Bateman, he made an impact. He got a touchdown. So, that was certainly impact. Now, we do, would like to see him even more. We would love that. And hey, maybe in the coming weeks, we'll see. I mean, we'll see on Sunday Night Football. But I know it's one of those things where it's been a conversation of we'll see with Rashad Bateman for a while now. But, I mean, it's still early in the season, so we will. Uh, he also said, uh, why are fans seemingly giving up on Tuck? Can we? Oh, okay, for that one, um, be because they see patterns. They see patterns, and it's scary. It's scary stuff. And fans just don't want whatever's going on to keep going on but it's been something that's been slowly happening for years so they're just scared we're scared we're concerned we want Justin Tucker to have a bounce back season and, and get right but we're concerned over what's going on he said can't we please stop running Henry outside zones and etc every time we send him up the middle he gets gains outside runs get him stuff more often ah mm, I wouldn't say that um Cause like, but the touchdown run that he did get, the long touchdown run, a couple of them long games did come up the middle. But when he's been doing them runs to the left, they've been working. Now this week, it, let's see what happens because he got Ronnie Stanley over there and Linderbaum. Uh, Linderbaum obviously at, at, uh, in, as, as a center, but at left guard, who's going to be that left guard? 
And can they continue that strength of the left side of the offensive line? He said, I just seen we signed Yannick Ngakwe. We signed him about a minute before I started this email. I was going to say that we need someone to create pressure. I appreciate this signing. He said, <laughs> he said hopefully you broke the news already, but this should help open a ways game up. And I appreciate Calvin Oy and all he's doing. Oh, yeah. They just like, I feel like our pass rush has been pretty good in them first three quarters. But I feel like with Yannick Ngakwe, he could help, like, get him a rest, uh, get him a more of a rotation. Not a rotation. Cause I don't, you don't need to be subbing in and out, in and out. But he could, like, allow them just – he could alleviate a lot of pressure off of them while putting more pressure on the quarterbacks. He said, uh, I truly wanted Hassan Reddick, but he may want a big payday. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, Ravens. I mean, he's on defense, so Ravens might be thinking about it, but – I don't think so. He said, this game frustrated me. Coaching can't let off the gas because better playoff teams come time may be able to close out better than Dallas did. You got one coming up on Sunday Night Football against the Bills. So if you get up to a good lead on the Bills, which I hope that they do, you cannot let up because Josh Allen, and they could score like that. He said, Lamar is frustrated with the play calling like that fourth and one trying to get a jump. Then they punt anyways. I pray we work out the kinks and be locked in halfway or way before the bye which is week 14. Sorry for the length of this question from subscriber, but man, shout out to you and Gray. No, no, no. Shout out to you, King. All right? We appreciate this. That was a fun one, and I'm sure this one will be too. It says, can't take the heat? Then get out the kitchen. Next question came from my guy, Ray Sean. He said, what's up, Ingram? The team keep it clean. I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet. I'm going to refrain from using the words weak and soft. I have noticed that there have been multiple occasions where when the offense is not doing their job, Lamar being the vocal leader he is, has to put them in check, mostly the offensive line. But it seems like whenever he does, there is a Ronnie Stanley, a Pat Ricard, or Nelson Aguilar telling him to calm down and chill out. Uh, like they don't want to hear or respect what he has to say. I doubt that when Lamar has to get on somebody that he is being disrespectful or talking down on anybody. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I would highly, highly, highly doubt that, especially like knowing like Lamar's character. Like, yeah, anyway. Uh, he said it's almost like the offense can not take criticism or want to be held accountable for subpar play. Uh, Lamar is always sticking out for his guys, and if he is getting on you, then you are doing something wrong. Well, that's a good point because yeah, he he that boy will take up for anybody, man. He always taking up for somebody, and he will he'll not only take up for you, but he'll put it on and be like, oh no, that's that's on me. Oh no, that that's my guy. That's on me. That's my fault. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, continue. He said, uh, if. If someone put Lamar in check, if he wasn't playing up to the standard that he should, and someone had to get on him real quick to get his head back in the game, I bet he would take it, move on, and apply the criticism to his game. Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Peyton Manning, and others have all got on their guys and held them in check with no back talk. Why is it such a big deal when Lamar does it? I mean, if you can't take the heat, get out the kitchen. Ah, with that, um, it's like, what's that, that, that saying goes, it's like you... You will hate somebody for all the same reasons you love them, something like that. But anyway, I think that might have actually been the wrong saying. Uh, but people have, um, people have been saying, Lamar needs to speak up. He needs to speak up for the longest. People have been saying that for years. He needs to be more of a vocal leader. He needs to speak his mind. And that, now he's doing it more than ever, like more than ever. But there's people that for some reason they, they don't like it. And I don't know why because I feel like that's just another benefit uh, of Lamar Jackson, him speaking up because it can help out a lot. Because it's like, like you mentioned, like if you can hear a lot of stuff from a lot of other people, but if you're hearing it from Lamar, Lamar is telling you, like, hey, tighten up, like, let's get this right, like, let's fix this. Then it's like, ooh, <laughs> I done really messed up. I gotta tighten up. So it's only a good thing that he speaks up. It's only a great thing that he gets on guys when they messing up because, hey, if he's messing up, there got to be somebody to get on him, too. DBs, and it's time to tap in with Rashad, baby. Next question came from my guy, Gus. He said, number one, DBs, Marlo. I've seen a lot of good and a lot of bad from Marlo so far this season. He needs some work on the jugs machine for more possession interceptions that he's been dropping. Hey, that's why he plays cornerback, because he can't catch. He said, hey, he's a pro athlete, so I'm going to just sit down on the topic of Marlo with this. Some players are DBs for a reason. Oh, he said it. <laughs> number two, Brandon Stevens has been a clutch player, just got to get his head turned around on some jump balls. Yeah. That's true. That, that's very true. He said, Marcus Williams has also shown flashes in the first three weeks. Just give it some time. He'll start getting real comfortable soon. Marcus Williams has been, he looked, uh, sometimes he looked a little timid. Sometimes he looked like he like holding back a little bit. Maybe he don't fully trust his arm. I don't know what it is. Um, but we, yeah, we'll see. Because Marcus Williams, he could play. He could obviously play. So let's see how these next couple of games go. So Ardarius Washington is a darn good player. And I'm excited to see what they do with him in the upcoming weeks. Yeah, that, that boy is balling, man. 
That boy be doing this Whenever he's on the field He looks good man And looks comfortable He don't look scared or nothing. But he be playing Kyle Hamilton He's been quiet Besides the rush on Dak I haven't heard much of him yet uh, It's still early And like Marcus He's gonna get comfortable Real soon We've been hearing more and more With Kyle Hamilton Week after week um, Yeah he did get that Pass rush on Dak Prescott He got a really nice tackle On uh, Sunday against the Cowboys too Where he, he tackled I think that it was a screen play I believe But he tackled the, the player Who caught the screen Then he got so hyped I think he was like Mad and frustrated And hyped all at the same time And he took his helmet off And was like Doing like a little mini celebration But then he said Hold on let me get this helmet back on So I don't get fined So he, he went and grabbed it real quick But shout out to Super Duper Kyle he said, Nasty Nate is a hidden gem on this defense. I can't wait for him to fully be able to show us that Ravens mentality we've been missing in the DB room. Yeah, Nate, Nate Wiggins going to be something, man. He, like, to do, to do what he did in his first start, like, it's like, okay, all right, you got something, man. And he said, question one, how many interceptions, if any, do you think Nate Wiggins gets this season? And how many do you think the defense as a whole? Oh, that's, that's tough. Nate Wiggins, uh, him, I will say, I'll say four. Uh, the defense as a whole, ooh, I'll say, I, mm, I'll say 19. Uh, and he said, number two, tap in with Rashad Bateman. Rashad is playing. I don't want to say prove it ball, but I'm looking at his contract as a prove it contract. Oh, that's exactly what it is. It's a very safe contract because it's not for much money at all. I think it's like worth a little over, it's, it's in between like five and six mil per year. So it really ain't nothing. Uh, he said he's been productive and is always ready when Lamar calls his name in clutch moments. I've been very high on Bate through the draft process, through all the injuries to now. I think Bate can play the Jacoby Jones role in this offense for the Baltimore Ravens. He's tall, can move a decent yak, and is clutch in moments he needs to be. Now, when you say that stuff, yeah, Jacoby Jones role, though, in the all, I, I don't see that. Like, well, I guess, I, oh, okay, okay, I guess you're just talking like, if you're just talking clutch, then that's it. Because when, when Jacoby Jones... I think uh, obviously the, the 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 mile high miracle Joe Flacco Jacoby Jones, um, and he did make some plays throughout the regular season on offense, but his primary thing was special teams. I guess that's that's why whenever people say that, because I've heard a couple people say that before, that's why I, I just don't see it like that. But like you mentioned, he's ready when when Lamar calls his number. He's been ready thus far. I think he got. Oh yeah, he does have that one drop against the Raiders though. So that. But besides that, <laughs> Rashad Bateman, he he's been ready. Uh, he said, uh, "Do you think this year uh, we can have a record of at least eleven and six, or at most thirteen and four? Um, we sitting at one and two right now. They can. It will take a lot, almost perfection, um, to go thirteen and four, in my opinion, because." You uh you already got two two losses under your belt, um so that would mean only two more losses for the rest of the regular season. It's doable. It's doable. Like Ravens, they could be sitting at three and zero right now. A few little adjustments here and there, they could be three and zero. They could also be zero and three. <laughs> so little things go this way and that way, they could be zero and three. But they they one and two. So um they could they they really could uh have that regular thirteen and four eleven and six. Oof that um. Mm. They could have that too. Uh, but I think everything just with these two records, looking at those, it all just depends on how the Ravens act and how the Ravens adjust moving forward. He also said, if it were up to me, 14 and 2. But it's not, so we could only hope. Sorry for about the long question. And yep, hope you, the fam and team, keep it clean. Is having a great day or night. Go Ravens. I appreciate you, Gus. And do not apologize. For sending no long question You had a lot to say And you got it all off your chest So we appreciate it Now real quick Before we continue Sometimes And my apologies I don't know why it does this But some people Who send the question via email Sometimes it'll end up in spam So I was just checking my spam The other day I said oh man We got like Two three questions in here That's in spam That we could have been done by now But So my apologies for that Anyway uh, this next question came from my guy, Michael. He said, what's good? Hope all is well with you and the fam. Oh, everything is good. I appreciate you. He said, I'll get straight to it. I don't know if it's just me, but after the Cowboys game, even though we won, I didn't feel good about the win. The Ravens continue to play this weak style of football in the second half, especially in the fourth quarter, blowing leads. It's to the point that you can't even get excited anymore until the clock hits all zeros. Yeah. It's true, because I remember that Cowboy game. We were hyped. We were ready. We were excited. We were all happy and stuff. We were like, yeah. Then Justin Tucker missed that field goal. It was like, ooh. Nah, this can't No, it's not gonna happen Cowboys win score to touch it. It's like, oh, okay Nah, this ain't gonna happen Ravens gonna be straight Cowboys win and got the onside kick it's, Oh, uh-oh Here we go And we just knew it was gonna be one of them games again Thank goodness the Ravens pulled it out But 
it was looking like it. Anyway, he said, uh, it's starting to get pathetic at this point. Someone needs to be fired, in my opinion. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, Ravens, not, they, they, they're not going to do something like that. They're not going to just fire somebody because uh, they're, they won a close game. Um, they're not going to just fire somebody because of these collapses. Now, if they were losing, and they have lost, but if they kept losing due to these collapses, then possibly, maybe, maybe. But who would it be? I don't think it would be who you think it would be. Um, I think they will look for some different people to put the blame on first. Uh, but they would not start at the top with firing anybody at the top. Um, they will go to a defensive coordinator. They could even possibly go to an offensive coordinator. Uh, but if you're thinking head coach, then uh, it ain't going to happen. 